All right, cool. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, last session of the day, so um, we'll get through it nice and, um, nice and quickly and, and get straight to drinks. But I'm really excited to talk to you today about um, some, some cool Power BI stuff that, um, that I've been doing recently. Uh, so uh, my name's Matt Davies. I'm a principal consultant at Redify, um, which basically means that I'm across um, a whole heap of our projects, um, across software, across BI and, and data and analytics in general. So. Um, seen, seen lots of cool stuff and, and, um, and excited to share that with you. So I guess like uh, over the last couple of years, um, we've, uh, we've been pretty heavily involved in the data and analytics space at Redify and, um, and we've started to build some, um, some pretty interesting capabilities and Power BI is a tool that's come up a lot for us. And the scenario that it's come up the most in is um, we've, we've found for, for years and years and years that the biggest scope creep in all of our projects by far beyond anything else is reporting. When a client comes to you and they're like, um, we, need, uh, we desperately need this report as a part of the admin system within our application, it has to look exactly like this, it has to have this functionality. But the, the issue comes about from the fact that while you're in your sprints, while you're building your applications, it's really hard to tell what data you have access to. It's really hard to to know what you actually need as a report for, as an end result because your users haven't used the systems. They haven't, um, they haven't actually played with, uh, with what you're coming up with and, and tried it all out. So um, we, we've been looking for alternatives and I, I think Power BI is a really, really strong, um, a, a really, really strong tool in, in that space. Is, is there anyone not familiar with what Power BI is? Anyone hasn't played around with it before? Cool, just a couple. So I'll. So I guess this isn't like a 101 talk, but I will try and um, I will try and at least explain what it is, so that you can um, so that you can follow along. And um, I, I think it should still be useful for you guys too. So, um, I, so just I guess covering what, what we're going to talk about. So I'll start with some background, which is why I think this whole thing's really important. Uh, we'll move on to what things do we need to think about when we're building our, our applications? What kind of um, data do we need to capture? What, what, what do we want to have in mind while we're building our apps to make the process easier as we go through? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about ad hoc exploration, which I think is one of the strongest features of Power BI, the, the ability for our non-technical subject matter experts to explore all the data sets within an application that you're building and come up with ideas and play around with it and figure out for themselves what insights and reports they need um, rather than it being like a direct part of, of development itself. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we can expose some of the data from the apps that we're building to Power BI in such a way that it's, it's a really low barrier to entry for our, our business stakeholders to be playing around with that data. Um, we don't want them to have to go through really complicated authentication mechanisms and um, access requests to servers and things like that. We want to make it nice and easy. I'll talk about building a, a report really briefly. Again, like most of you are kind of familiar with that by the sounds of it, but um, just, just to sort of touch on some of the lessons that I will have covered. And lastly, we'll cover, okay, business stakeholders built a report as a part of our application development. Now, how do we take that report and distribute it out to the business and productionize it in such a way that um, it's not actually gonna cause us more problems down the track? Cool, so uh, I wanted to talk about big data for about eight seconds. So big data has been the, the buzzword of, of years and years and years. Everyone was doing big data for years now. But what, what we sort of found as Redify is that, uh, yes, everyone was going out and collecting these terabytes of data and, and storing them in their data warehouses and so on. But no one's really been uh, really focused consistently on using that data until the, last, until the last couple of years. And what we're seeing now is that data is in every application that we're building. It's a core part of um, you, you don't just go out and build an app for a, a user or a customer anymore that doesn't leverage data and analytics in some way. It's, it, it's, it's a part of everything we're doing and it's a demand we're seeing from, from all of our customers. So um, I, I guess that, that kind of ha has led to something that's commonly called a data culture, which is this idea that organizations that are really competitive and strong in the current market are using data to make all of their decisions on, um, on both their operational processes, but also for like their wider decision making um, from, from the lowest levels right up to the executive levels of organizations. Um, they're expecting that data is gonna be there and in place to, to support this type of decision making. So um, one of the best examples of an organization that can um, leverage that type of data culture is called a learning organization. 
um, which is the idea that if you support all of your employees to um, make, their, make their own decisions, to provide insight into your decisions through providing you data, provide them time for reflection and, uh, and, and time to come up with their own ideas and contribute, then all of a sudden you have data sources from across the organization and insights from across the organization that you weren't leveraging before. Um, and, and part of why this is so relevant at the moment is that tools like Power BI actually open up the ability for anyone in the company to contribute insights based on data that's available. And, um, and that's something that, that we've really seen as a really strong trend. So the, the quick, I guess, um, 101 on Power BI is it, it came about, um, they're actually quite old now. It's actually, I think, um, I think around 10 years old, some, uh, something like that in its original form. And it, it came about as this idea that, cool, we've got Excel, um, all of our users, are, all of our business stakeholders are really comfortable with Excel and comfortable with connecting directly to SQL databases with Power Query and, and playing around with all their data and building reports like that. But um, what, what happened over and over again, people would build their Excel spreadsheets, put them in a share drive somewhere or email them around and eventually you end up in this situation where you've got a bunch of out of date Excel reports flying around. Like I'm sure everyone's seen it, I've seen it a hundred times. And, Power BI came about as this idea that you could use all of those existing skills, all of that knowledge people built up um, by generating these Excel reports, but make visualization really easy, make data exploration really easy, and make sharing those out really easily, uh, as well as give a, a really powerful ability for us to try and embed those reports within applications rather than trying to come up with them ourselves with our own graphing and, and charting libraries. So that's, that's our sort of 101, and I, I guess why, why we care as developers, or why I think we should care as developers. Um, uh, as I sort of said, like we as Redify have seen this trend where, uh, where customers are demanding more insights, but more so than that, we're seeing a lot of, um, can you build me a report specifically to answer this one question, or can you, can you give me some insight into this single part of my customers? Just like these once-off questions, and they're not really worth going through full report building processes within apps. They're the sort of thing where if you empower your customers, they can go understand all this stuff themselves. And the second part, I suppose, is that we use this stuff really heavily in our own business. Um, Transparency is a, a pretty key part of what we do. You can, as an employee, go in and see any information you want about Redify. So how many people we've got, where they are, what how much money we're making, what sales opportunities we've got coming up, everything. It's all sort of open. And that came about because of that learning organization trait. We just empowered everyone as a part of the work they're already doing to, um, to contribute Power BI reports, to build up a shared dashboard, um, just, just, through, just through enabling everyone to access that data and do what they needed with it. So that's, that's I suppose, why it's been relevant to me for the last few years. But talking more broadly than that, um, the, the first sort of point why, why a wider community would care about this is that BI typically has just been the realm of um, BI specialists. So many organizations have people that are very trained in BI and, and very experienced at, uh, at pulling together really convoluted complex data sources and coming up with really cool insights into them from that. But uh, that's, that's no longer just the realm of those experts. It's tools like this that uh, empower us to uh, to build these types of insights and reports ourselves without having to go to the experts every time, which empowers the experts to start focusing just on the really complex stuff and training everyone else on how to do the more simpler types of problems. So I think that's really cool. Um, the second is that it's, it's quite often a, a huge pain to build all these reports yourselves as a part of app dev. Um, the, I, I, over and over again, I found myself in situations where I'm, I'm trying to understand the latest charting library that you should be using, the latest animations I need to apply, trying to work with designers to make things look exactly perfect based on people's expectations. It can be a bit of a pain to do this stuff yourself, and uh, I don't think that's the state we need to anymore. We can use tools like this to just make our lives so much easier and not have to go through that. Um, and the last reason is that data exploration that I was talking about means that we can build the right reports rather than very early on in projects building what we think is relevant. So um, that's, that's, I guess, the, the main focus of the talk today. And, uh, and what I hope that you get out of it is the ability to spend less time on this reporting type functionality of, of application development yourself and 
um, more time on, uh, on outsourcing that th through to the people who are actually experts in understanding that data. So, uh, the first thing I want to talk about uh, as part of that agenda is creating and capturing data. So, we're, we're sort of in this world where, um, and, and uh, yeah, sort of in this world where we've got these countless sources of data, data from every possible place imaginable. It's not just the data we come up with as a part of our application development, there's, there's, there's countless different sources. And uh, something that we've found as Redify as we're leveraging more and more software as a service and uh, as we're leveraging more off the shelf applications for our own usage um, is that that introduces a whole lot of interesting challenges above and beyond what would happen if you're just trying to come up with reports from your own data sets. So, um, there's a whole heap of ways that we can um, try and solve that and, and, and try and um, make that easier on ourselves. So I wanted to try and start with, I guess, some practical tips for what to think about it at this sort of early stage when you're building your apps. Um, the first is if you're using off-the-shelf applications, this might be you're customizing them as developers or integrating them with other systems or um, implementing them in some way. Um, try when you're talking with vendors to figure out how you get access to your data very early on. Um, so often we hear stories of um, vendors who keep the access to, to your own data within their own boundaries and don't really let you get to it easily. They keep the IP behind it basically. And getting access to that really early is super important if we want to be able to build insights off it. Uh, the second is making sure that you have the right, um, the right frequency of data. So making sure that if you need real-time data from a system that you're implementing or customizing from a vendor, that you can actually get to that as often as you need to. Because so often, uh, again, you'll, you'll have scenarios where you can only get an update once every 24 hours or something like that. And that might not be enough for the insights you need. So um, something else to think about. And try to ensure that you make it easy for business users to get to those data sources. And that's one that I'll go into a bit more depth on because it's um, it, it's actually quite a complex topic. How do you aggregate these thousands of data sources in such a way that business users can get to them easily and build reports off them? So um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward, but something to think about when you're having early conversations. Uh, custom apps. So these are the, the sort of four things I'm thinking about when, whenever I'm doing custom application development. The first is keep all the data that you reasonably can at the most granular level that you can throughout app dev. And, uh, obviously, we've got counter arguments to that that come up a lot, like your kind of emergent architecture, just capture what you need as you need to. But with data and insights in particular, it's really hard to go back and add a lot of that stuff later. If, if you're opening up the flexibility for your business users to build these reports, um, but you have to go in and make application changes to support them, then that friction actually stops that working well. So finding out ways to just capture as much as you can. And that's as simple as, early in your app dev process, figure out a way to abstract that information capture, figure out a way to make it so easy that you don't really have to think about how to capture that sort of data. Um, the second is try to keep linking information with other systems. So if you're customizing a CRM, for example, make sure you're keeping both your ID for a user as well as the CRM's ID for a user as well. Um, it kind of sounds like common sense maybe, but uh, again, that makes things so much easier later down the track if you have a way to link together all these different disparate data sets. Uh, third is think about how you might use um, reporting feedback loops to improve your apps. And by that I mean if you've got your stakeholders coming up with insights as you're building the app, they can feed back information to you as to what, whether or not what you're building is even the right thing to be building. It's just another source of um, information you can use for making decisions. And the last is think about questions you might want to answer later, but that you don't quite have the ability to deal with right at that point in time. Um, but keep that list and make it really visible and, and really obvious to the team so that as soon as something crops up that's related to a question you thought about earlier, you can, um, you can deal with it at that time rather than straight away. So there, there are, I hope, some, some practical tips for things to think about when you're starting to look at Power BI. Uh, so the next thing to talk about is um, trying to expose all that data to Power BI in a way that our business users can get to it easily without jumping through a whole lot of hoops. So uh, this is where I'll start going to um, a few different demos because I think some of this stuff is probably easier if I show you. Uh, has anyone heard of the AdventureWorks 
database before. Yeah, lots of nods, good. Uh, so I use this all the time. But um, this is basically a data set, for those of you who don't know, that's just um, dummy data um, that's cleaned up to be anon fairly anonymous that Microsoft distributes. So I've loaded that ahead of time into a local SQL database, so you don't have to see that. But I'll tweet out the link in case you um, in case you need it at the end. You can go grab that, and you can go download basically a database with a huge amount of um, useful information for playing around with stuff like this. All right. So um, Power BI, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, like I said, familiar to a fair few of you, but. Um, if you haven't seen this tool before, this is the desktop viewer for Power BI. You don't need to use a desktop application to build reports and, and use Power BI. There's a web portal that will do a fair bit. Uh, but anytime you're starting to get into complex scenarios, it's worth getting this because it, um, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier. So I've got that AdventureWorks data set loaded up locally. So all I have to do is get data, SQL Server, uh, in this case, it's on my local DB, and it's called AdventureWorks 2012. So there's two um, data connectivity modes, import and direct query. Import will actually copy all of the data from, from your queries into the Power BI report itself, kind of like a cache, uh, which makes things really fast to develop on. It means that you don't have to requery the database every single time you, you change a filter or alter your data. But it means that once you get to production, you have to think about refresh cycles and, um, and, and making sure that data is up to date and, and, and kept like that. So uh, for this particular demo, I'll use import just because it'll make things a bit faster for us. But we try to recommend people use direct query as much as possible because it makes things so much easier down the track. You can. Uh, so the question was, can you change midway? Uh, you can, but there's a few things in direct query that, um, sorry, there's a few things in import type queries that you can do, which will then mean you can't then change to direct query. So as early as you possibly can, <laughs> basically. So let's pretend I'm a uh, subject matter expert working for, working for a bike shop, as I think this example is. And I'm interested in, in having a look. And my developers hooked me up with this data set from the app that they're building. So I can come in here. I can look at all these different um, tables. I get a little preview of what the data is. So I can go, all right, interested in that. Um, in this case, let's say that I'm interested in looking at the employees for this organization. So check the box next to that, load that. And because I'm on import, what this will do right now is go, um, go directly to that database directly to that table that I've mentioned and try and pull in um, all of that information directly into the report. And that will load that straight into Power BI Desktop so that we can start altering that and, um, and doing queries on it. So you see it kind of uh, goes through a few different steps to do that. This can take a while with remote data sources, which is another reason that direct query is um, a really good idea um, early on in most applications, unless you're kind of doing a demo like this locally. So that's loaded in. I can see this data set has popped up on the right. But the direction you want to point most of your stakeholders to early on is this Edit Queries tab, uh, where you can, again, get that preview view. And, and you'd sort of see probably immediately, if you haven't seen this before, that it's pretty Excel-like. You can um, filter things. You can, um, you can pick and search for different data. You can group data. Um, you can make all these adjustments, and you can get this into a state where it's, um, I guess, clean data that's pretty easy to work with. And you can do all that without any programming. So um, that's already like a pretty powerful thing to be giving out to non-technical users. Uh, so let's pretend in this case that, I have, um, that I've made some filters. I've, I've adjusted this uh, as I think I need to. And then I'll go back into here, and I can click just a, a, and this is so simple, like click a box next to these things to start looking into them and start trying to generate insights. And that's not, it's not easy when you're just looking at a huge table of data to come up with any useful insights. But when you come into this view and you start clicking things, that's when you get some useful knowledge. So uh, let's say that I'm interested in um, the country of the employees. So I've clicked that. 
that's all that is is like text fields with um, with the country of, of the employee and it's gone straight away and said okay visualization here's a here's a world map with all of the different countries that use it from and you can kind of look at this and straight away go all right it's kind of interesting but I don't really get much out of that like um, okay there's some employees in different countries but if we then say uh, how about we take something unique like in this case email address and drag that into size then we start getting like things that are a little bit more useful because now we know okay most of our employees are in North America as we're building out this system maybe we want to look at those specifically to to, um, to to figure out some some useful ideas from those so that's the data exploration part of Power BI and like hopefully you can kind of see from that that by delegating that out to people who understand these data sets, they're, they're way better placed than us as developers to, to figure out what might be useful as reports. So um, that's that aspect of it. The second aspect of data exploration is, um, I won't bother going back to slides, but is basically as soon as you start giving business stakeholders direct access to data sources, that's great. They can come up with their own insights, awesome. But you'll find pretty quickly that everyone starts coming up with their own version of things. Uh, people, will, people will come up with their own reports. Someone in the room next to them, I've seen this before, will come up with almost exactly the same thing. But they'll reach their conclusions in different ways and you'll end up with slightly different data sets being held by slightly different people. So one of the ways that we can try to avert that problem is something called Data Catalog, uh, which is another Azure PaaS service. Uh, now, what this lets uh, employees do or any employees in an organization is publish data sets that they're working on or that they know about within a company so it's it's basically a giant data dictionary in in more traditional BI terms and uh, you can just come in as as any user that knows about some data source that's available click publish data and you can um, launch an application which will um, which will let you do that which will let you put the data source you know about in a publicly searchable catalog that anyone else can go find. And that just helps avert a, a whole other set of problems that can come up. So the app that that pops up with when you click launch looks just something like this. You can pick a data source. So in my case, um, I've got that cool AdventureWorks database, which is a SQL server on my local machine. I can type in what that is. Um, I won't have encryption, I don't think. Cool. So what that will do is then give me all of the databases on my local machine. Um, in, in a real scenario, you would obviously ideally be connecting to a SQL server that's hosted somewhere, maybe like a test or a prod environment. But um, for the sake of this demo, these are all the databases that are a part of that server. And I'm interested in sharing the AdventureWorks database with people particularly let's say the person table. So I can click into that, there are all the different columns. And the really interesting part, and I'll show you this in a second, is you can include a preview and a data profile about that. Um, that's really hard to read. <laughs> but um, but the, this one here include preview and this one here include data profile. So you can register that data set and that will just pop it straight into the catalog. So if I show you what the catalog looks like, make a little bit more sense as to why that's so useful. Hopefully. Cool. So um, I'll come in here and let's say that I'm working for a, uh, a sporting organization. So um, just a, a sports center that organizes, let's say, like local volleyball and, and basketball games for people. and. Uh, I'm an employee that's really interested in getting some insights into what kind of games are being played. So I'll come in here and I'll just search for games. And uh, someone has, someone else in the company has very kindly published a data set called Casual Games. So if I have a look at that, you can see that someone's gone in, published a data set that's called Fixture Games. That's not very useful. That doesn't actually mean much to a, to a um, non-technical user. So they've named that Casual Games, given it a description. There's an expert there, so I know who to contact if I'm interested in that particular data set. It's tagged, so I can go and easily search it, and it's got connection information against it. But the really useful part is preview. So 
I can go in and see um, that's the, the top 20 rows that, I think it's the top 20 rows that are a part of that data set and go play around with it without having to download or connect to anything on my local computer. I'm like, cool, that data's available and I can just go use it. Uh, so that's super useful. You can go to data profile tab which gives you a bunch of stats. So how many different rows are there? What's the, what, are, what are some of the um, small values? What are some of the large values? So you can, get some, you can get some idea of what you'd be working with without even having to actually open it up. But when you do decide to open it up, your, your users, be they technical or non-technical, can go in under open in. They can pull down an Excel spreadsheet. Not very useful. We kind of want to stay away from that if we can. Or they can pull down a Power BI desktop file and that file is preset up with that connection to that data set. So you don't have to go through complicated hoops to, to help them connect to it. They can just go download a file and start playing around with it. If, uh, if the data set needs some kind of permission to access, so if, say, normally you have to go through a request processor to get approval to go get to it, the under, I think it's under here, you can... Uh, Yeah, so for, for, for most data sets, you can come under here and type in under request access, um, hi, I'd like access, and that, would, that will send a request straight to whoever the expert is for that data set. So it even simplifies processes like that where you normally have approval in place. So pretty cool, and I think that's a, um, that's a useful tool to, to start looking at as, as a part of making that process really easy. Obviously, all data sets are not going to be as simple as just a SQL database. Um, so we'll talk about the more complicated ones in a little bit, but we want to make those obviously just as easy if we can too. Cool. So uh, I think that's it for those two demos. So, so great. So we've got some, um, we've got some SQL views. We've got, uh, let's, let's say that they're SQL. We might have some more complicated stuff like OData APIs. We might have really complicated APIs that have custom pagination or you have to do special requests to or something like that. And that's where things start getting a little bit more interesting. But uh, let's assume that we've provided those data sets to users. The next step from there is how do we get people to, to deduplicate on the Power BI reports themselves instead of all coming up with their own Power BI reports, which is almost the same problem that we were in in the past. Um, how do we reuse stuff? And as of about, I think it's about a week ago, um, live connections went to general availability, which is this idea that you can connect Power BI Desktop to a data set that someone else has already published to Power BI without coming up with your own over again. It'll just connect straight to the one that's already there, um, which is super useful to look at. But again, if, if we're talking about complex data sets, really complicated APIs or whatever it might be, um, a, that, that's still not super useful, and that's where data connectors come in. So data connectors are basically a, a, a really simple way using, the, um, using a SDK for Visual Studio to build your own um, connectors into Power BI. So you can do a connector for any data set imaginable. And what we've started doing in a lot of cases is coming up with connectors which wrap all of the complex stuff. So wrap up authentication so that your business user doesn't have to know if it's OAuth or if it's, um, or if it's some other authentication mechanism. Wrap up that stuff, wrap up the details of the data itself, so provide, I guess, like a simple view over the top of an API that they can just do that exploration with and play around with, and then publish that as a connector. So I'll show you what that looks like. So first step is grabbing the um, Power Query SDK. Um, probably can't read that link, but again, I'll tweet it afterwards. The second step in Power BI Desktop is to enable that as an experimental feature. So assuming that I'm still on duplicate, good. So if you come in here under options and settings, under options, under preview features, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if you can't read that, that's OK. You'll see a whole bunch of stuff underneath there which, which are custom features, custom experimental features Power BI's got. All of them are actually really, really useful, apart from one of them that I've got unticked. So um, it's worth going in there and having a bit of a play around if you haven't checked those out before. But one of the main ones there is custom data connectors. So uh, if we tick that, 
then we can load those up. But I'll show you what one actually looks like in Visual Studio first. So one of these files is basically, um, or one of these projects, uh, they're pretty simple. <laughs> you have PQ files. And a PQ file is, um, it's actually M code. I don't know if anyone's played much around with M before, but um, a fairly, fairly simple language that's used a lot uh, when describing how to work with data. Can everyone at the back kind of see that? It's still a bit small. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Hopefully that's all right. So uh, what this will describe is a, a couple of things about the connector you want to build. So in this case, I've said grab a client ID from, um, from a text file that's part of the solution, grab a client secret. These are both OAuth parameters. I'm not actually going to bring up the files with my client ID and secret because I've learned from all the people who have been trolled at this conference so far when they've done that. Um, but you basically keep those in text files along with the solution, or you can go get them from anywhere else that you need to. So, um, so encrypt them in with a file system or um, however you typically store your credentials. So after that, we'll describe um, methods that we're interested in. Um, in this case, we have one main method, which, um, which you just define by setting the name of the custom connector equal to a thing. And that thing in this case is, hey, we're using OAuth. Here's the method that you call when someone wants to authenticate. Here's the method that you call when someone's finished authenticating. And here's some, um, I guess, text to help describe exactly what it is that you want from users. And um, again, you kind of see why that's so useful when I load up what this connector looks like. Uh, underneath that, you can define, if you like, some icons and some UI stuff for it. Um, probably not too important to cover, but um, again, it's kind of nice. And then the really interesting part is the actual methods that you define themselves. In this case, we've said, go talk to the GitHub API, um, get the contents of a URL that we give it, um, get that as JSON, and then convert that to a table. So instead of, um, instead of users connecting to an API and getting back a blob of JSON that makes no sense, we've now presented that in that same Excel view that, um, that had that SQL database we're looking at, which is really easy for people to work with. Um, in the GitHub case, the API has pagination, so um, each API call that comes back will have a link to the next page of data that, that you could look at. And again, that's, that's kind of a pain if um, our non-technical users are trying to build reports and, and try to understand how to do pagination. We don't want that. So we've got a method here that looks for that link, um, looks for what page that we're on right now and fetches any data that it doesn't have. So it wraps up all that complexity so that as a business stakeholder, you don't have to deal with it, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's what that looks like. If I build this connector and open that up in File Explorer, uh, be under bin debug, because I'm building a debug. So that'll build a .mes file. And a .mes file is, is just that self-contained data connector. So the story for actually deploying these onto users' machines is not brilliant at the moment. You basically have to copy them into a folder under My Documents that sits on everyone's computers. Um, Microsoft are working on putting copies of them um, up in the store so that people can just go and point and click to download them. But I, I guess if you really wanted to simplify that, you could like write a script to help users keep them up to date in the right folders or something like that. For the sake of this demo, I'm just going to grab that, copy that into the right folder. So under Documents, Microsoft Power BI Desktop Custom Connectors, probably the only part of this that's, that's not quite there yet. So uh, I'll, again, I'll, um, I'll tweet that out afterwards. So I've added that in. You have to restart Power BI after you've done that um, so that it picks up any of the new connectors that have um, come up as part of this. Now, the GitHub example, I think they've actually added a real GitHub connector now. So um, it's not quite as cool of a demo, but um, you, you can kind of get the idea at least from, from what this is trying to do. So if I go in here and I do the same thing I did before, get data, but this time I search for GitHub. Yeah, there is. There's a beta GitHub one. And I click on my GitHub NDC sample. You see it straight away pops up with a box. And in this case, it's just asking me for, um, for a URL. Um, probably not going to mean a lot to most people, but you can customize all of this. So um, I can customize this box and say, please enter the specific GitHub API URL that, that um, contains all the data that you're interested in. 
um, if it's always the same, or if it's um, or if it's yeah, if it's always the same, you can just obviously put it in as a part of the connector, or you can give them some way of exploring the API in coming up with this. In our case, I'm going to grab this one I did earlier. So this is just the list of all the uh, users' repositories on GitHub, just a um, just one of their standard JSON APIs. So I'll plug that in and click OK, and because I've done this before, it's already authenticated me, but I'll actually go clear everything so that you can see what this is supposed to look like. It all uses, to do all its OAuth, it all uses um, Internet Explorer's engine. So let me clear all that, cancel that. Uh, under, your, under your recent sources, we should be able to see that. Sorry, under edit queries, you can see all the like previous authentications that you've done. And I'm just going to clear out that one that I did earlier and do that again. So get data, Power BI, NDC sample, throw that API URL again. And this time, you can see that it's asked us, um, it, well, it's given us, okay, cool, you want to connect to that API, you aren't signed in. Typically, if you just do a normal Power BI connector that's out of the box, your user then has to specify how they're going to authenticate to that. Whereas in this case, we've wrapped up all the details of client secret and ID and all of that inside the connector. So all we have to do is click sign in. So that might take a second, but that's basically going to pull up um, just a, a browser window inside Power BI. Just going to ask us for our... Um, for our GitHub credentials, and that will go away and go through a normal OAuth flow. It'll ask me, "Hey, Power BI wants to access your account. Are you happy with it? Giving uh, happy with it? Understanding what repositories that you have access to, and assuming that we're all good with that, which hopefully we are, that will then redirect us back to Power BI with the authentication all dealt with. So that's again, pretty powerful and just another way that we can reduce that friction and, and let users start to explore some of this data themselves. Um, cool. So if I connect to that, that will go to the API with our authenticated token and come back with the data set. Now, the GitHub API by default comes back with a bunch of these record objects, which I'll show you what they look like. So record objects are, um, are basically um, anything that's a complex object that you can't just show in a single field, so, you, so you'd expand them out. Um, one of the things that if we were to take this connector a bit further, we could do, and another really powerful thing, is describe how to expand out these, um, these sub-objects within an API so that a user doesn't have to go in and do this themselves. But in our case, we can expand out that column. Um, we can see underneath here we've got a whole lot of fields like ID, name, um, URL, etc. So we've got all of our GitHub data and you can see under there all of the repositories that, um, that I'm a part of or, or that I've forked, which is um, getting to be a pretty long list. And underneath there, there's uh, uh, underneath some of these other columns, we've got more record fields. So for example, if I expand out this owner field, I can also get a whole lot of sub-information on, um, on the owner of each repository. So again, we've taken a data source that normally you wouldn't just be able to go explore in Excel and Power BI and wrapped up all the complexity and, and, and put it out there. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll close that. Again, I could do the same thing that I did previously and start um, getting more insights into that and exploring it, but I don't think we need to. Cool, so that's that. And then the last point to talk about in terms of providing that data out to users is um, this idea of pre-processing it. So your data might not still make sense to users if, if you don't do something to it first. So there's a bunch of services in Azure where you can pre-process data. You've obviously got things like machine learning, um, things like uh, stream analytics. Uh, you've, got a, you've got SQL Server analysis services if you want. So you've got all these steps that, if you want, you can apply to data from the apps that you're building before you provide that out to users. Uh, useful if, you're, if your data sets are really, really complicated and you need to simplify them a little bit first, or you want to wrap them up and, and, um, and do analysis on them beforehand. So um, another thing that's kind of useful to think about, um, I guess, when you're, when you're in your app dev process. So 
I don't want to spend too much time actually building a report given that I, I suspect a lot of you have done that already before, but we will go back to, we'll go back to that AdventureWorks example and we'll just talk about what are some of the things that we want to make sure people actually do when they're building reports um, to, to make sure that they're sustainable and, and useful for the whole organization. So I'll load up that data set again. Now, some of the things to think about when you're teaching people how to actually do these reports is that BI dashboards are not, uh, are not as useful if they're just radiating um, simple information that you could go find elsewhere. Ideally, what you want to do with them is come up with information that lets you make decisions. So um, make sure that all of the reports that you come up with are actionable in some way. We try to make sure that all the reports we come up with are debuggable. So um, if two people have both built a different version of a report and they complain they're different, um, what capacity are we giving them to actually drill down into those reports and, and understand why they're different? So there's a couple of things to think about. And when your users are just starting to learn how to do some of this, they, that obviously might not be front of mind. So let's take that same example that I did before. So we'll take an employee's country. We'll size that up by some unique field about them. So, oops, and we'll make that a bit bigger so we can actually see it. Hopefully you can still see that at the back. So we've come up with, um, we've come up with this. Now, if we want to try and make this debuggable so that we can understand um, exactly why things look like they do, a really easy way to do that is just to add a table. So we can add a table underneath the report. We can put in that table the country, the email address. We can put in a whole heap more information first name, last name, and that already adds some interactivity to this rather than just a, rather than just a, um, a simple visualization. We can now do some cool stuff with it. So if I'm interested in, uh, let's, say, let's say I'm interested in Amy Alberts from the US, I'm like, okay, well, what, what can we kind of find out about them? If I click into that, that actually drills directly down into that user's record and looks at things like, okay, well, where, where are they from exactly? And we can start getting some, some more interesting insights into it just through making it a little bit interactive. Um, we can add, well, let's add like a filter on the side. So let's say that we are really interested in filtering just users that are in a certain, um, a certain province. Then, and we zoom this out a bit, then again, we're, we're, we can kind of filter this to um, something that's a little bit more useful. But the, the idea is now that we've just made those two simple changes, all of a sudden this is debuggable. If I'm questioning why there's so many users in the US, we don't have that many employees in the US, hopefully I'm not questioning that, then we can actually go in and look at the table and understand why that is. So just some kind of extra things to think about is trying to make reports both debuggable and trying to make them so that they're um, so they're interactive, or you can get some kind of useful insights out of them. Cool. So that's it for that. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is how we can um, how we can start distributing these reports and productionizing them and getting them into a good state. Yes, we've we've let our subject matter experts go away and come up with whatever they've needed to as a part of our app development, but. Now we want to actually make sure that these are useful long term and not just um, not just uh, waste away once they stop being maintained. So, three ways to share reports in Power BI, and there's also uh, a couple of ways to embed reports as a part of your application. So I'll talk about those two separate things um, after this. But let's start with sharing reports. So the simplest way is just literally to type in someone's email address and click the share button. Probably don't need to demo that. But that's, uh, that's the quickest and easiest way to get a report out there. But it's sort of also fraught with a lot of problems. If someone publishes a report, shares it out with other users, and then they leave the organization or they stop caring about the report, but that's become pretty critical to a business's process, then, uh, then all of a sudden that's sort of dangling there and, and not very useful anymore. So the way that we get around that, or we have gotten around that for the last, um, for the last year or so, is something called organizational content packs. Um, has anyone used those before? Cool. So an organizational content pack is basically a collection of reports and dashboards that you want to publish out to the rest of an organization. And you can go in as 
um, anyone in a company with access to those and subscribe to them and just see all those dashboards yourselves on your, on your own um, Power BI service online. So they're just a really simple way of sharing them as a pack rather than sharing them from an individual. And that, that already gets us a little bit further in that we can start to deal with better maintenance around them. But uh, organizational content packs present a few issues as well that, that we've come across. Uh, one of those is that if you share a content pack with, um, with your users, it's hard to distinguish between what reports came from the content pack and what reports um, you've just come up with yourself. It's, it's all just sort of one big list. So if I actually show you in here, so you can see under my workspace, uh, maybe you can see, basically I've got a whole lot of dashboards underneath there. About half of those are actually from a content pack, but it's really hard to figure out which ones are those and, and which ones are um, ones that have come elsewhere. So something that Microsoft have done is come up with concept of apps. So um, Power BI apps different to Power Apps, which, um, which is super confusing, but um, Power Apps are, um, are a totally different um, area of Azure where you can go and build applications without doing much development. Power BI apps are actually just an evolution of content packs. So what Microsoft did with Power BI apps is tried to solve some of those problems that I just described. So we'll try and make one. Um, so to make a Power BI app, I need to make a separate workspace. I need to actually make a dedicated space for whatever reports I'm dealing with to, li to live in. Uh, so we'll just call this one NDC. I can, unlike um, organizational content packs, I can actually share these with, um, with uh, security groups and, and subsets of um, Azure AD rather than just sharing with individual email addresses. So the security story is a little bit better. Um, but in this case, let's just say that I want to share them with um, anyone who's a part of my organization. And that will give us a dedicated workspace to deal with. So if I go back to my, um, to my fancy AdventureWorks report here and I publish that, then I can actually publish that straight into that workspace and we can make um, a Power BI app out of it in, to make it really easy to distribute. So um, I've got a few workspaces, NDC. Cool, so that will go away and just publish it. Um, you might be kind of thinking at this point, how about automation? And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second, but um, let's say for the sake of this that uh, that our process for releasing our reports is just to publish them out via an app and we're happy to do that manually. So that's published. If I go back into my, um, into my workspace that I've set up specifically for this app and I refresh it, then I should see a report as a part of that. So under reports, cool, I've got this test report and it should have all of that, um, all of that adventure works data. And one of the reasons this works is that I did import, so it's actually copied that data into the report and then published it. If I did direct query, um, I would need Power BI to be able to talk to my laptop, which is sitting here, which wouldn't work. So that's, that's all published, that works, all of our filters work. It's pre-selected the last filter which I had ticked, which is not that useful, but um, there you go. We might say we want to pin this to a dashboard. So, Um, obviously, ideally, we'd have a few different reports and pin those all into a single dashboard to give us some shared view. But um, in this case, we've just got our single report pinned to a dashboard within that workspace. So that's pretty useful. Now, if we want to share that out with people, we can go into that workspace And we can do this, we can click this button on the top right, which if you can't really see it that well up the back is basically just says publish app. We can say this application, this report is from NDC. 
whatever, some useful description that people can get to. We can say that the landing page is some specific thing within the report, so useful to set up a default view to, for people when they're looking at this. In this case, we've only got one report, so it doesn't really matter. And again, we can set access to specific individuals or Office 365 groups, um, or we can just share it with the entire organization. So that's done. That gives me a link that I can go share with people. And then I can give that to anyone who's interested in those reports. They can just go install that and it will actually show up, uh, which you can see on the left there before everything redirected, as a separate app, um, as a separate app within everyone's um, working environment. So it's totally separate. So that's kind of cool. And then you get a nice big heading saying this report is from the NDC app. <laughs> so they've, they've sorted out a few of those problems that we used to have before. Uh, so that's it for apps. Um, yeah, if anyone's got questions on those, obviously happy to, um, happy to chat about those afterwards. So we've sort of seen from that, okay, there's a whole heap of different ways to share things. There's um, beyond just those three, there's, you, can, you can do anything with these. You can copy them up to network shares and just get people to look at them in Power BI Desktop um, if you really have to. You, there's actually a Power BI server that you can install on premise if you're not allowed to have any data leave your, um, leave your premise and you're not allowed to use the cloud component of that. Um, again, if you have to, that's a, another useful option. You can put them into um, SQL Server reporting services, so publish the reports into that um, and share them with a, a, as a part of your reporting services, which if everyone is already going to one place to look at reports, that's another good option. Um, obviously, the Power BI service is a lot better in a lot of ways, so nice to migrate away from reporting services as you can. But um, another cool thing to, to think about um, that's kind of useful. But for us specifically, we're really interested in, okay, we've avoided writing these reports as a part of our app dev, but our users still say that they want the reports within the app. They don't want to go off to another place to um, have to go look at them. And that's where Power BI Embedded comes in. Now, Power BI Embedded, really similar in that you come up with, um, you come up with these reports, um, you publish them into ideally a dedicated workspace, but then you can actually call an API to get an embed URL for that report that you can then put straight into your application. And you can do things like get a different embed URL for, um, for all of your different users so that you're not just using one publicly accessible URL. But you can call this API, get an embed URL, and put those reports straight into your applications. Uh, that's, um, that's a really useful thing to, uh, to look at. Again, it's still going to, they're still going to look like Power BI reports. You don't have huge amounts of flexibility in terms of customizing exactly what they are. But if you can get away with that trade-off, um, you then avoid needing to do all this stuff yourself. So um, kind of another useful thing to know about and think about. Cool. Uh, so two more things. The second last thing is automation. So I mentioned this briefly. Uh, the automation story around Power BI at the moment is, is still not that strong, I don't think, in that you still in a lot of cases need to click buttons and, and do things in the portal to get things done. But fortunately, some of this can be automated. There's an API that will take a PBIX file, which is the files generated by that desktop application we're looking at, and publish those into a workspace. Um, you can get to it by PowerShell. You can, there's actually a REST API that will take the PBIX file as a form post. And so that's a start. We can start to build out our CI pipeline, um, our dev tests and our prod versions of those reports in our different workspaces. And then fortunately, all our users need to go do is click into those workspaces um, and click publish app from there. So at least we've solved some of that pain. But um, hopefully as they add more APIs, we can automate more and more of this and make that experience a bit nicer from that point forward. And the very last thing to talk about is, is I guess, our, our final productionizing, our checklist of things to think about. So um, the first is, have we made um, dashboards for all of the groupings of reports that make sense? Um, usually dashboards are useful as a perspective that a group of users might have. Uh, you might have a dashboard for your sales team who are just interested in all of the reports related to sales, dashboard for your people team for all the reports in, uh, that are related to people. So coming up with views that are useful and relevant to people that don't crowd them with too much other information, um, something that you can do. If you have had to use import type reports for whatever reason, making sure that you've set up refresh schedules for those and ideally communicated on the report what those refresh schedules are. So 
add some text inside the report saying this is only um, up to the updated every 24 hours or something like that, just so that everyone in your organization knows exactly how up to date all the data is. And again, they're not kind of clashing over different views of data. Uh, think about your authorization. Um, have you got um, have you got authorization embedded as needed as a part of um, data connectors, as we discussed? Uh, or, or have you thought about um, something else that needs to happen? Uh, have you created a content pack or an app and, and made sure that any of the custom reports people have built are actually wrapped up in those and distributed properly? Uh, have you set up Q&A featured questions? We didn't really talk about Q&A a huge amount, but it's, a, um, it's this box here that shows up above all of your reports. So you can, um, this, this particular report probably won't work terribly well for, but if I go into, uh, let's say, if I go into this sample dashboard, this is another one of the data sets that you can just um, grab off the Power BI site. This one's the human resources sample. And you can see if I click into this, I get a whole lot of um, Q&A questions that it just automatically suggests. So the first one is count of new hires. So you can actually just type in queries as natural language queries and users can, can conduct analysis that way. Um, in this particular case, that's not working very well. Let's try employee count. It's a fairly simple one, but again, that's just uh, that's just a way that if you haven't built a specific report, but you've published a really cool comprehensive data set, people can just go in and play around and do natural language queries on it. Uh, so something that you can do and, and which you saw in, in that example there is set up um, a, whole lot of, um, a whole lot of examples of natural language queries that users might want to do. It's pretty good at figuring out possibilities and, and exploring those and giving you options. But if there's um, queries that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be, I guess, intuitive to machine learning that, that you know about, uh, particularly where aliases of things come in or you've got crazy acronyms for different terms. You can put in suggested queries there, which is kind of nice. Uh, so that's something that's uh, good to think about. You can customize um, colors. You can customize um, some parts within it. So if you are um, working with a marketing team that likes to keep things particular on a certain brand, you can at least go some way towards that. So going through and making sure what you've published fits, um, fits as much of the criteria as possible there. Uh, check if you've added any new data sets that you've come up with to your data catalog, as we talked about, to make sure that other people can leverage them. And lastly, you have got some abilities, especially if you're using um, gateway connectors, for those of you who have come across those, to look at usage statistics. So um, kind of important, I guess, to look through our reports fairly regularly and check, are they actually being used? Um, uh, are they just confusing people and just sort of getting left off to the side, in which case we might want to tweak them? So um, I guess another sort of useful checklist to think about. And that's it. Thank you very much.